song, sing it out. Unless you come, will you meet me here again? Cause all I want, I see. Jesus a clap offering come on amen just be seated for one minute before we uh, get back into worship so good to have you all with us today a special welcome to empower 2023 <laughs> it's hard to imagine just 12 months we were here last year a special welcome to pastor uh, Richard Green uh, from C3 Church in Wright, Sydney. He'll be sharing the word uh, tonight and tomorrow morning. Uh, also, we have Pastor Michael DeSanike from the USA, who's here with us. Uh, visa all went through. Thank God for that. We have CCA pastors that are here uh, from the various states. Welcome. And those uh, visiting from interstate and also, of course, the congregation here from Adelaide. Great to have you with us. Um, our prayer is, in this time together that God will bless us and as we gather together to worship, to fellowship, to hear the word of God, that above all else we would meet with God and God would meet with us. Uh, Jesus tells the parable of the ten virgins. It's an, a, it's an end times parable about the return of Christ. And it says of the ten virgins, five had oil in their lamps, but five of them were not prepared. And so they had no oil in the lamps. And when the bridegroom came, they just weren't prepared. And there are so many thoughts that could come out of this particular parable. But the thought that came to my mind is I, I believe we are living in the last days. I think all we need to do is look around and see what's happening in the world and, and something's going on and certainly feels like the, the, the return of Christ um, more than ever before. And as individuals and as churches, we want to make sure that our lamps are filled with oil. In the Bible, the oil speaks about the presence of God speaks about the glory of God, the anointing of God, the Spirit of God. And in the last days, we as individuals don't want to do without the presence of God. We need the presence of God in our lives. In the last days, what we need more than ever, more than anything else, we need the oil of the Holy Spirit to be in our lives and in the life of our churches. So what is Empower Conference all about? Well, it's an opportunity for us to turn aside, to meet with God, and to allow him to fill our hearts, to fill our lamps with oil. It's an opportunity to connect with God. It's an opportunity to hear the voice of the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit and to allow the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts. The Bible says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. How many people could do with some dunamis in the name of Jesus? Acts 2 says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So, empowers an invitation from God to you and to me. And he's saying, just come and meet me here. Let's meet together. Because I want to speak to you about your future. I want to restore, bless, heal. I want to fill you. And that's our prayer for this conference. Can I hear an amen? amen? We don't need just another conference. We don't need just another gathering. There's plenty of our conferences, plenty of gatherings, plenty of sermons out there. But what we're going to do above all else is meet with God. It's turn aside, meet with God and say, Lord, would, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? I want to hear your voice. I want something to shift in my life, in my heart. So I just pray that we would prepare our hearts and allow him to do just that in this conference. Let's all stand together. And so, Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And we just thank you for the church gathering together. And, Lord, we've all taken time out of our schedules to, to meet here, Lord God. And, yes, we want to meet with each other, but above all else, we just want to meet with you, Lord God. We want you to speak a word into our hearts. We, we, we want you to... Fill our hearts with your, your anointing, your spirit, your power, Lord God. Father, there are many of us have come with different ideas, different situations happening in our lives. But I, I just pray that you would minister right where we're at in the name of Jesus. 
Father, we come against every work of the enemy, every distraction. Father, every scheme of the enemy, Lord God. We just come against it in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the victory that is ours in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And I, and I thank you for what you're going to do. I thank you that you will speak. I thank you that something is going to shift in our hearts. I, I thank you that the word of the Lord is going to be spoken with boldness and without fear. I, I, I thank you that something is going to happen in our lives. Something important, distinctive is going to happen uh, in our lives. Definitive, Lord God. And we will give you all the glory and we will give you all the praise. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen and amen. Come on, church. Let's worship together. Amen, church. How are you doing? Come on. We're going to worship our um, God. Amen. That's it. Come on. I was breathing but not alive. Who could carry? Who could carry that kind of Till I made
God we love. You're worthy. You are lifted high. 
There is no one above you, God. There is no one above you, Jesus. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Every dark addiction starts to burn. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus.
Come on, just continue to worship the Lord. Let's continue to just glorify the name of Jesus. What an opportunity just to be able to cry out to God. and Let's talk to God about what you would like out of the conference. Just talk to God about where your, where your expectations are. The Bible says, where there's a sense of faith, God begins to move. So what are our expectations before God? Just speak by the Holy Spirit, Lord God. Minister by the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, just speak to the Lord right where, right where you're standing. Build an altar right where you're standing. Just begin to worship the Lord. Speak to the Lord about 
what it is you want through the conference. We need you, God. I want to meet with you, Lord God. I want to glorify you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. That's a good thing, isn't it, to ask the Lord what you want from the conference? Even as Pastor Joe was saying, ask what you want from the conference. And what I want from the conference is revival. You know, the last time I was here for an executive meeting, and your Pastor Mario was preaching there Sunday morning, and he said, revive us, Lord, revive us, O Lord, otherwise how could we rejoice? And I like what Charles Finney said. Charles Finney said, you know, revival is a conviction of sin with repentance, followed with an intense desire to live according to the word of God and to submit one's will in deep humility to the will of God. I thought that was so profound. And I really believe that whatever we ask God for, he would do it for us. And as Pastor Joe said, you know, he said that the, the imminent return of Christ is very, very near. And the greatest thing that the church needs is revival. People need to come to that place and where they will surrender their lives unto the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Amen. Amen. So let's lift our hearts this evening as we start this great conference you know, which we all come in great anticipation to receive and believe God to do great things in our lives. Shall we join hands as you stand there? Just join your hands together. And we're going to pray and we're going to believe God together. God hears the cries of His people. Amen. He knows what's on your heart, what's on my heart. And He's moved by us. He's moved by, the, by our lives, what we need, what we desire. There's going to be breakthroughs in your life through this conference. God's going to minister to you powerfully. You know, you just open your heart and say, God, I want you and nothing else but you. We look to you, Lord, and to you and you alone, for you have the answers. You have all our, all our answers in your hands this evening. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you that we are gathered here. Lord, you brought us together because you love us, you care for us, you're merciful, you're gracious and loving, Lord. Oh, you're good and faithful to each and every one of us. But Lord, our heart is all, Lord, steadfast in you, Lord. And this evening, as we begin this conference, Lord, we're believing you for a great move of your spirit amongst us. Lord, none of us want to leave this place the way we came, Lord. God, we want to meet with you. We want your presence. We want to carry your presence wherever we go, Father. Oh, Lord, without you, we are nothing, Lord. With you, we are everything, Father. So I pray that there will be a divine deposit that will take place in our lives. Oh God, through your word, through your servants as they minister their word to us, we pray that you will empower us, you will ignite something fresh in our lives this evening, Father. Oh Lord, that we'll take back to our churches. Oh God, that our churches will never be the same, that this church will never be the same because you visited us. God, we believe you, we receive from you, and we give you all the thanks and all the praise for all that you're going to do in our lives through this conference. Oh Lord, we thank you for healing the sick, healing the broken hearted, setting the captives free and delivering your people, Lord, to walk in that freedom and in that liberty that you have called us to, Father. Oh Lord, we love you. We thank you, God, you'll never disappoint us. You're merciful and good to us. Lord, we just commit this conference into thy hands and each and every one of our lives to you. And we pray, come kingdom of God, let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in each and every one of our lives and in the life of your churches. In Jesus' name we ask, Lord. And all God's people said, uh, amen. Come on, you can do better than God. God's people said, amen. It shall be done. Amen. 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 Powerful, powerful time of worship. Before we get into the rest of the service, why don't you turn to the person next to you, give them a warm greeting, a real greeting. Awesome church, great buzz in the house. Take a seat. A big welcome to Empower 2023. So good to be in the house of God. You know, um, Paul says to the church of Philippi, he says, my goal is to know Christ and experience the resurrection power of Christ. 
You know, I know it's the end of the week. I know it's a Thursday night. I know sometimes we've just come after work. But I really believe that the Holy Spirit wants to give us a fresh encounter. I believe that when you know, God wants us to know Him in a new and fresh way, that more importantly, we're going to experience His resurrection and power in our life through this conference. Amen. Amen. God is good. God is good. Well, before we get in, I've just got a few, share a few announcements. And I must say, I've got to confess my sin. You know, I had a power conference, a few past DC, so they already sensed could be something wrong. But as I was walking on stage, I, I didn't just see, but I kind of tasted some of the supper beforehand. And it was amazing. It was phenomenal and I, I promise it was a name of quality insurance that's my job role all right it was amazing so after the service don't rush home go to the foyers free supper it's going to be a great time of fellowship and it's going to encourage you to go there it's going to be a great time after the service now we're back here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m and we're lucky enough we've got actually a cafe open from 8 a.m so come early get your croissants your toast with Nutella, your coffee, it's all there, 8 a.m. We'd we'll love to see you there. If you haven't registered, don't show us. There's still time to register. Just head to the information desk or see those square things on the floor. We can register there as well. Um, and lastly, just want to call the ushers for We are so blessed with your generosity so that we can have a conference like this and we couldn't do it without your tithes and offerings. So um, as you can see on the board, if you'd like to give, feel free to give online or head to the information desk. God bless you and let's get excited for this conference in Jesus' name. Thank you, worship team, for leading us so well in worship. Come on, give them a hand. I love that QR code. Who knew what a QR code was three years ago? No one knew. <laughs> We've all been educated. I still believe, it's just a hunch, that uh, the QR code people actually invented COVID. That's just my... To, to, ma to mark it. Sorry, sorry. That's a bit controversial. I'm sorry. but. <laughs> well, it's an awesome pleasure to have Pastor Richard Green... Uh, with us here at Empower Conference 2023. Give him a hand, come on. <laughs> Richard and his wife, Kathy, are the senior leaders of C3 Church right in Sydney. And Richard and Kathy planted C3 Church right in 1999. And since then, church grew to over a thousand, has grown over a thousand people. Um, Richard has over 25 years of ministry experience involving church planting and has planted over 100 churches around the world in nations like the Russia, Ukraine, Syria, uh, Kazakhstan. On Sunday he goes and uh, he leaves Australia to minister in some of those incredible countries of the world. It's a great passion for the kingdom of God and is, in my view, the real deal. We've got two great speakers here for this conference who are, in fact, the real deal. <laughs> And it's just incredible. I spoke to uh, Pastor Richard about 18 months ago through a mutual friend, Ian Juggleman, Pastor Ian. And we spoke on the phone. I thought, you know, I knew Ian was a great guy. And I thought, well, uh, I knew that Richard was one of his disciples. So I want to get in touch with Richard. And, and that first phone call we spoke, I don't know, half an hour, three quarters of an hour, just exchanging things. We, we talked about all kinds of things. And there was kind of just an affinity between us. He ministered here in February. And I just love his heart, his spirit. Uh, and his passion for the kingdom of God is a humble man and doing incredible things in God's kingdom. So it's a real privilege to have him with us uh, uh, for a couple of sessions in Empowering Conference, especially tonight. Would you give him a big, 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 big warm welcome as he comes to minister the word. Well, it's wonderful to be in Adelaide. Adelaide's my hometown. 
I once said um, uh, to people, uh, I used to work as a professional musician, that was my first career, and I used to do some touring and, you know, would tour up to Sydney and all sorts of places and see people would say, uh, what's Sydney like? I said, it's all right to visit, but just I don't ever want to live there. <laughs> now I live there. I say to people, please, please, when I die, take my bones home. <laughs> I love Adelaide. There's something happening in this church. Joe and Lena, the, the, you've done a great job. This is a beautiful church. My conviction is that we need more churches in the radical middle. And uh, I sense the Holy Spirit here. Um, this might sound a little bit out there. There's a sound. I heard a sound. I'm saying, Lord, what is that sound? I could hear it. I was trying to work out what pitch it was. That's my musical head. But it was a sound of heavenly activity. There's a heavenly activity over this congregation at the moment. This is a season. <clears throat> you won't always have it. But it's a season of preparation. The Lord is at work in this church rearranging a whole lot of things. You haven't seen the physical rearrangement yet. Because the Holy Spirit in his grace is actually <clears throat> preparing you. He's trying to give you big ears. It's a bit frightening. <laughs> I thought it, it's old people that get big ears, but anyway. He's trying to attune you to really hear him. Really. The, uh, what you are going to be in the next five years is nothing like what you are now. Now that sounds exciting. To me it sounds terrifying. <laughs> But the Lord is calling all of you to tune in. Amen. There is a sound happening here. Um, where's the, your worship leader? Yeah. You do three jobs. You're studying, are you? No. If you finish studying. No, I have <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, that's the same as studying. <laughs> do you watch Utopia? No, I don't. It's too frustrating. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> you've got a number of things on the go at the moment. Um, you're quite busy. You're not getting enough sleep. You think you can do away with sleep? You stay up really late, yes? Yeah. Uh-huh. You, you can't do that. No, no, really. It's not good for what the Lord wants of you. You should be writing songs, a lot of them. <laughs> now... <clears throat> You'll have to write 20 songs before you get one good one. No, I'm being serious. Because you're going to have to get into the slot. But once you crack one, and you're not to copy, you'll allow it to come out of you. Because the songs that you are going to write are going to reflect the sound that's got to come from this church. It's really, really important. The lady on the um, uh, violin... I saw you surrounded by kids. I saw, saw a lab coat on you. I don't know what that is. Do you work with kids at all? I can see all this stuff around you. There's education on you. Um, are you an educator? I'm starting to self-help and I'm thinking about how to help people that are self-help. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> right at the, then you are called to that. That's what you're meant to be doing. Okay. You're going to be working... Um, creatively with very traumatised children and you're going to bring them into a sweet spot. At the moment, um, there's some confusion around your world. It's like you've got the wrong key for the wrong door and it's quite frustrating. It's almost like things are not opening for you. Does that make sense? Okay. Don't fear. Don't fear. It's okay. You just... Sometimes you get very, very frustrated extremely frustrated. You look very calm on the outside, but actually you quite... It's okay. I'm a little bit like this myself. When no one's looking, you're a bit explosive. <laughs> That's okay. 
God loves a passionate heart. But the Lord is going to do remarkably remarkable things in your life. I see the Lord actually, you're going to move houses too. Are you in the process of thinking about that? Yeah, okay. Um, that's going to happen for sure. And um, <clears throat> noise bothers you. <laughs> and so where you're living now at the moment is very noisy and you want to move to somewhere a little quieter. Um, and it's okay to dream to live maybe in the Adelaide kind of hills. Uh, well, don't live there then. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Okay. It's all right. So Jesus, we pray for a move, a smooth move, an easy move, and do it really well in Jesus' name. The Lord spoke to me about. Um, there's some a couple people here that have phobias, serious phobias. Um, I've never had a word like this before. Um, <clears throat> but you can't seem to shake it. And some of it has to do with traumas with dogs. So, but there are some people that are suffering with phobias and I want to pray that that goes, really. Um, can you help me? If that's you, can you just pop your hand in the air? You've got a phobia, want overcome that phobia thank you your name's not Julie by any chance is it whoa she was close because I felt the Lord say it's a lady whose name's Julie Jenny Jules something like that father I pray right now by the power of your spirit Lord the authority is in your name and we pray in your name the authority is not in volume, it's not in, in noise. The authority is in the name of Jesus. Yeah. And so, Father, we pray that you take your hands off, Ju uh, off uh, Jane, is it? Jane, take your hands off Jane, Lord, and just sort this phobia out. Lord, let it just dissipate in the mighty name of Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Wonderful. Meet me here. Why don't you close your eyes when you hear that theme, meet me here, which way do you hear it? Do you hear it you saying to God, meet me here? God coming to you? Or do you hear it him saying to you, meet me here? Father, I pray by the power of your spirit, <clears throat> you ought to open our hearts because you're a God of meeting. You're a God of encounter. You're a God of relationships. And without a divine meet, meeting, Lord, we are going to remain unchanged. So, Father, I pray you speak to us by your spirit. Amen. <clears throat> this is going to be uh, part one of two sections um, and I am going to be quoting quite a bit of scripture and I want to give you some practical things that <clears throat> I think are important. So here we go. You ready? Okay, Luke 6, 12, 13. <clears throat> one of those days, I love that, one of those days, just um, one of those days in the life of Jesus. Do you know you can be having just one of those days and Jesus can call you? In my experience, it's just one of those days in which he interrupts when we're unexpected. Jesus went up on the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he designated apostles. Let's put it in the Australian colloquialism. He's up in, on the mountain, he's praying all night, and he says, meet me here. 
I want to suggest to you, we're living in a season where we've got to say, God, meet me here, and we've got to hear him say, meet me there. Because we need a much bigger global vision. Because there's so much happening. Um, <clears throat> now, it's the meeting that creates a context. And it's the context that will determine the content. I feel so blessed to be here tonight um, because right in the front row here is uh, Pastor Danny Guglamucci. When I got born again, I got born again at Clemsig. The first person to really embrace me and disciple me was this man. And I remember him saying, would you meet me here? And he gave me his address. <laughs> now, <clears throat> nothing happens without a meeting. God is relational. You know, I, just as a side, I get quite frustrated I wish I wasn't Anglo. I wish I was of a different ethnicity because I've got to tell you, Anglos don't do meetings very well, right? I want to be Italian. I want to be Sri Lankan because the meeting's always food. <laughs> meeting, far more goes on with God in meeting than in delivery of content, we are consumed by the concept that if we get enough information, we can change our world. It's rubbish. In fact, the more information we're getting in this world, the more divided we're getting. Everyone's screaming at everybody with all their ideas and theories. That's a new one, Joe. COVID came from the QR code. <laughs> Can't wait to share that. But, you know, if you could just meet with somebody, it solves so many problems. So many. But here we have Jesus calling the disciples to himself. He called them he wanted. Do you know, before he calls you to reach the one, you are his one. He meets with you. It's just so beautiful. You know, um, when I first got born again here in South Australia, <clears throat> there was Danny, and then there was another man, an older man, and um, he happened to be a Catholic priest, spirit-filled. His name was John Halloran. And um, <clears throat> I met him. Oh, he just used to laugh. He was hilarious. He was like Father Christmas. <laughs> you know, he had that sort of you know, wanted to touch his face. It was all soft and sort of... <clears throat> he used to laugh and I was a bit of a hothead, you know. I was, you know when you get born again, you're full of passion? And he'd laugh, ho, 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 you're so zealous, you hothead. <laughs> you know, I love you. He would ring me up and he'd say, would you meet me here? Four o'clock in the morning. So I'd go and meet him there. And do you know where there was? It was a chapel. Every morning, four o'clock, two hours. But I could see Christ in him. And so I wanted to be with him. Because I thought, if I'm with him, this man meets with God. When I talk to Joe, I know he's a man who meets with God. I met Mike for the first time. I thought, he's a man who meets with God. David, you're, you're extraordinary, my friend. You're a bit crazy. <laughs> you're a, a working, you're a working machine. To me, you're like a Holy Spirit fox terrier. <clears throat> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I would meet with this guy, this this beautiful priest. Uh, you know, it's what's wild about him, he built what was called the John the 23rd Centre out near Mobbury. The, the whole story with him, he got filled with the spirit. The Catholic Church didn't know what to do with him, so they sent him out to Mobbury before they built the Mobbury Shopping Centre. 
And they put him out there because they knew he wouldn't have a church and a Catholic priest has to have a church. So he, they thought, oh, that'll stop him. So he went to the shopping centre owners and said, look, there's a lot of Catholics here. He had an Irish... I won't do the Irish thing. There's a lot of Catholics in there. It'd be very good business if you let me have mass on Sunday in the middle of the shopping centre. And they did. <laughs> he went on to build John the 23rd centre. John the 23rd was the Pope who called for a new Pentecost to hit the church. 78 million Catholics got baptised in the Holy Ghost following that. Phenomenal. He went on to raise all this money... Builder, and then they got nervous with him. So guess what they said? They said, "Oh, we, um, we, 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 you, you have to visit everybody on the east coast of Australia." They thought if we get him out of a church, then he's not going to do any damage. And he he did that for a number of years, and he he would ring me and say, "He'd never say God said." I love that. So no manipulation. He would say. I was praying this morning and I saw your face. I'm wondering if you'd like to meet me here. And off I'd go and meet with him. We're living in psychiatric wards and all sorts. It was crazy. But man alive, it was awesome. You know what they did to him? He went to them and said, you've got to give me a church and they, or otherwise send me to China. Guess what they did? They sent him to China. <laughs> Guess what he did? He took the Holy Spirit with him. Because God met with him, and whoever met with him met with God. Now, there's a beautiful passage in Exodus thirty-three eleven. I love this passage. It says, The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. I've got to tell you, if we can create a context where people are drawn in, where we're meeting with God, they're going to catch something in them. It's really important that we understand that our job is to create context before content. Now, I want to ask you a question. Uh, would you put your hand in the air if you've either done a certificate a diploma, a university degree, any further education. Would you put your hand in the air right now? Up nice and high. Up really high for me, will you? Okay, would you keep it up if you, you, you remember 100% of what you studied? <laughs> Have a look around. Not a single hand up. Put your hand up if you think you've retained 80%. Well, you must be a genius. <laughs> Can you lay hands on me? <laughs> Put your hand up if you may be 60%. 50%? 40%? 20%? I've done five degrees. And I think I've retained about 10%. That's the honest truth. You know, the reason being is that we've elevated content above context. Faith, particularly is more caught than it is taught. Why? Why? I mean, you hear that phrase a lot, but why is faith more caught than taught? What's faith? Just recently, I'm, I'm writing a systematic theology that's been translated into Russian, particularly aimed at Russian speakers. And there's, there's <laughs> the word believe... And faith is exactly the same. Now, if you understand the original language, you know the root of that. But they don't have any distinction. The problem with that is, it says in James, even the demons believe. But demons don't have faith. Why? What is faith? Faith is trust. You can't teach trust. You have to demonstrate it. They have to see it. Context will eat content alive any day just as values will eat vision any day because values create culture it's really important now have you ever tried to catch something that you can't see would you close your eyes for me <laughs> catch not a chance David. <laughs> 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 
You can't catch what you can't see. You can't catch it. We are people... See, this part of this conference, I believe, is also about leadership and growing in your abilities. We have to be able to demonstrate stuff so people can catch it. You can't catch the cold unless you're with somebody who's got the cold. And the closer you get to them, the more likely you're going to get it. Didn't we learn that? It's like me one night I'm sleeping, I'm dead asleep, and I sneezed. And my wife was not happy (laughs) because half my bodily fluids came out. (laughs) When you're close, proximity is everything. We've got to create proximity. I'm talking for real here. I feel so blessed because this man here really did have a huge impact on my whole life. If you talk to my wife, right, we've spent hardly any time together. That's the honest truth. But right at the beginning, he said, meet me here. And when I met him there, I got close to him. What was he doing? A Bible study? No. Playing pool. We elevate content way too high. We've got to create community. You know, the church is dying from performance. We're dying from performance. A performance creates pressure. We are called to establish community that requires patience. And it's faith and patience that are the power twins, as it says in Hebrews. You got it for us, content is remembered momentarily and has to be recalled intellectually. Whereas context allows for content to be recorded permanently, recalled immediately, and actioned intuitively. The best leaders in the world are intuitive leaders, and everything, everybody says, oh, they're very intuitive, as if somehow it just fell on them. You know where intuition comes from? It comes from your gut. Where does your gut come from? It comes from making mistakes. You learn implicitly, deeply, and that's why the church has to regain the table. We've got to regain the place of meeting. This is an awesome theme. I, you know, I said to Joe, who picked the theme? He said, oh, our creative guys are awesome. Well, I didn't know whether to thank the creative guys or kill them <laughs> because I had to think deeply about what this means. Now, so first thing, let's make it our goal to create context. Free up your time. Free it up to waste a little. We're so jolly busy. Free it up. The second thing I want to say to you is that not just about content, but there needs to be a focus on the content, or so the context. Let me read to you 1 Corinthians 4.15. Paul says, You have 10,000 guardians, 10,000 teachers in Christ, but you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I became your father through the gospel. Now, what does a father do? They are available. What we have, we've got people running around preaching and doing all sorts of stuff and motivating and... I don't actually like, I mean, Joe, beautiful, thank you. I love this church. But I avoid speaking at conferences. (laughs) I do. I had somebody wants me to speak to 200,000. I said, I don't want to speak to 200,000. Give me 30 people that I can spend three years with and let me develop them and they'll multiply. Like... The church needs to regain fatherhood. And I'm not talking about maleness. I'm talking about this, the protective nature of fathering. And, you know, we've got to regain respectability. We've got to regain the heart, the connection. And Paul says, I became a father. Now, what's really important here, Paul just didn't decide, I'm going to be your father. It says he became a father through the gospel. And that is really important. 
Now, let me ask you, I'm going to give you some questions. So I'm going to give you a bit of homework. All right, so let me just put it really simply. I hear people talk about the gospel and I think that's not the gospel. The sinner's prayer is not the gospel. A hand up at the end of the service is not the gospel. It's an element of the gospel. The gospel is simply good news. Now, what is news? News is something that has factually happened. Yeah? And if it's good, it's something good that has factually happened. Here's the facts. Jesus, God incarnate, came. That's good news. So it means that his incarnation, God with us, is part of the good news. It is good that God is with us. Paul said, I've become a father through the gospel for you. So what do fathers do? They help people ask the question, where is God with you? Here's your first question, right now. Because we have to ask it for ourselves before we can answer it for another. Where is God right now for you? Where is God with you right now? Just close your eyes for a second. Where is God for you right now? Is he in front of you? Is he at the side? Is he behind you? Is he above you? Now, I'm using devotional language. That's not theological language. It's, it's just to give you an image. Where is he? He is Emmanuel, God with us. Where is God for you in this? If you're in a mess, where is God in the mess? If things are going great, where is God in the good things? But where is God? Do you know what I, re- what I learned from the, particularly this, this Catholic priest? I would watch how he prayed. You know, the first hour nearly killed me because it was silent prayer. <laughs> well, but I'd be looking at him, be like this, when I look at him, and he looked like he was in love with the Lord. He just had the scriptures open. And then the next hour, he'd start to pray from his heart. And I'm hearing him pray. The best thing you can do to develop anybody is to bring them into your prayer time. Do you know, we've got to remember that the church was not birthed in a committee meeting or a strategic meeting. It was birthed in a prayer meeting. First question, where is God with you in this? The second, the good news is not just that God is with us. The good news is that God speaks. Wow! Do you know, I work in Muslim countries and we led an imam, true story, his name is Ali Muhammad. He's one of our pastors in Iraq. Ali Muhammad was an imam and mullah for ISIS. Yeah. And, you know, he said to me, he said, Richard, I realised there was no sense assurance of salvation for a Muslim. And there was no sense that God could speak to me personally. We have the good news that we have a God who speaks to us. And how does he speak to us? If you ever wonder, very clearly through the scriptures. Let's start there first before we start getting words of, you know, gold dust and feathers. Like it's clear, it's in the scripture. I love the scriptures. I open the scriptures. And you know when you open the scriptures, I open the scriptures and I think, what? I never saw that. It's clearly there. I'm not coming up with a new revelation, but I just didn't see it. And then all of a sudden, oh my goodness, I just saw it. Wow. I love the scriptures. People say, oh, you know, if you get a bit bored with the scriptures, you know, get a different translation. I think, what? I just love the scriptures. It's his word. He speaks to us. So here's the second question. How is God speaking to you in this? Right now. Maybe you haven't even asked that question. I had a person ring me up in the middle of the night. Not middle of the night. It was probably about 11.30. And I said, pastor, pastor, pastor. Oh, just it's driving me mad. Was it a pear or an apple in the garden? And I said, I'm going to sleep. You read your Bible. <laughs> no, I didn't do that, but that's what I felt like, Don. <laughs> okay, you can't get a revelation from me 
You can't get a second-hand revelation. You get it. And he's dying to speak to you. Whatever circumstance you're going through, he's so hungry to speak to you. Meet me here. Why? Because I want to talk to you. Come up here. Meet me here. I'm going to talk to you. Second thing, how is God speaking to you in this? The third thing is the good news is not this that God speaks, but he acts. For every I am statement, there is a miracle. I am the true vine. What does he do? He doesn't just say it. He turns water into wine at a wedding where they'd lost their joy. That's a Middle Eastern wedding. That's equivalent to an Italian job. Right? No wine, mamma mia! Like all the relatives are uptight and everything, it's not a good, good wedding. He turns water into wine to bring joy. He doesn't just say, I am the vine, he does something. He doesn't just say, I am the resurrection, he actually raises Lazarus. Every I am statement, I'm the bread of life, he produces miracles where he reproduces bread. See, some people might say, I'm, they might say, you know, I'm a very generous person. Well, I, so what? Show me. You don't trust somebody who says something but doesn't do it. You can absolutely trust God is a God who intervenes because he said it and he's doing it. So here's the, net, the third question. What is God doing that is beyond you now? What is he doing that is beyond you? Or maybe that's where you've got to push in. Matthew 17, 20. Because you have so little faith, I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will be moved. Nothing will be impossible for you. There's awesome uh, historical context to that. Because it is highly likely that he was looking at the Temple Mount where Herod had taken the top off a mountain. So he's referring to actually somebody having immense tenacity to to do the impossible. But Jesus is saying far more than that. He's saying you can do way above that. Just if you have the smallest amount of faith. The third thing that's good news is not just that God... Um, is with us, that God speaks, that God intervenes, but the gospel is also about God reconciles. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 18, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we no longer regard anybody from a worldly point of view. I love that passage. That has been one of my key passages in all my leadership. When I look at somebody, I no longer consider them from a worldly point of view. You know what I do? I look at a person and think, if we we get the kingdom seed in you, regardless of whether you want to change or not, you're going to change, baby. I just believe it. You get the gospel into somebody, it doesn't matter how messed up their life is, I'm not going to look at them from a worldly point of view no longer. Everybody that's on the street, I just see them as they're about to say yes to Jesus. We change our view because Christ died. It says in this passage that we're in, goes on to say that we're his ambassadors, he's making his appeal through us. We have the, reconcilia- we have the ministry of reconciliation. So here's the question that we ask. Where are the marks of the cross of reconciliation in our life? Where are those marks? Now, just hang on to your hat for a second. Because I'm going to go somewhere which is challenging. So in Colossians 1.24 it says, Now I rejoice... In what was suffered for you. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, which is the church. What does that mean? Is Christ's death on the cross not enough? That's what it seems to be saying 
But it's not that at all. What it's saying is there's circumstances that we will face in other people's lives that require us to take the reality of the cross and take upon the suffering that he had and go into those really difficult situations, putting aside our comfort so that we carry reconciliation, step into some horrible situations which are going to cause us to suffer so that we can bring deliverance and liberty to those. Christ is calling us to be ministers of reconciliation, to carry in us. So here's the question. Where are the Lord's marks of his cross in your life for others? You know, people say to me, oh, you must love travelling. I hate travelling. I don't like it at all. I've been doing it for such a long time. And I'm not flying business class. I'm flying economy. Because I want to make sure we've got enough resources. I'd rather we spend the rest on others. Now, not everybody believes what I believe, and that's okay. It's all right. Mind you, I have had a few upgrades, but I tell you what, what's really... Once you go through that curtain, you don't want to go back. (laughs) Please, Jesus, upgrade. (laughs) Dang! Amen? Do you know one thing that's really important for us is to make sure that we just don't get used to all of our appetites being fed? It's really important. But God, not just the suffering, but the gospel is not just us being people carries reconciliation. The good news is that not just that God came, he spoke, He did powerful things. He died on the cross, but the gospel is he also rose from the grave. So God defeated the very last bastion of every obstacle. I mean, once you're dead, you're dead. There is no final barrier, but he defeated death, which is incredible. So the question is, where in your life is there the demonstration of the Lord's power and defeat over obstacles. I remember when I first got born again here in Adelaide, there was a band called More Than Conquerors. They used to annoy the heck out of me. <laughs> like, I was a musician, and I'm thinking, oh, what? Anyway, Urgh! More Than Conquerors, yeah, More Than Conquerors. I've heard this passage preached so many times, but we get the wrong aspect. I don't want to be more than conquering. That sounds exhausting. Like you conquer one battle, then you've got to go and conquer another one. If you're more than a conqueror, surely you have to conquer several times. Do you want to keep conquering? I don't. That sounds exhausting. You know, in Scripture, in in Romans 8, it says that we are more than conquerors. I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present, future, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the, the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. But you know what we forget? We forget what is before that passage. And this is what it says before that passage. For we, verse 15, for we did not receive a spirit that makes us a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. Do you know what is more than a conqueror? A king, a prince. That's why we are more than conquerors, not because we've got to conquer. It's not by might nor by power, says the Lord, but by my spirit. So where are the marks in our life? Where is God demonstrating his victory by his spirit in your world? God came. Incarnation, good news. God speaks, that's great news. He not only speaks, but he acts, that's awesome. But God also, the good news is that he reconciled us. 
And we have this reconciliation ministry too. And not only that, but God defeated, rose from the grave. That's good news. And I suspect that we do something very odd with this next one. We don't include it in the gospel. But Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father to pour out his Holy Spirit to give us power to be his witnesses. As soon as you disconnect gifts from the gospel, you've got a problem because it all becomes about my gift, about my ministry. Uh -uh. The whole reason you receive power is for witness. I cannot witness to Jesus without the power of the Spirit. Impossible, too hard, too difficult. Acts 1.8, you'll receive power when the Spirit comes on you to be my witnesses. The purpose of the power is for witness. In Jerusalem, that's your neighbourhood. Judea, that's in Victoria. No, that's probably Samaria. No, I think that's another end of the world. <laughs> But that's the purpose of the power of the Spirit. Now, all of us suffer from our own insecurities. That's the honest truth, I think. Well, maybe not you, I am. I'm very insecure. And so we often feel, Lord, I'm not worthy, I'm can't do this, whatever. So we need the Lord to speak to us. Now, we think that we're unusual. But let me show you something. We're going to read Matthew 28, verse 16. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mount to which Jesus had directed them. Just pausing there. This is after Jesus' resurrection. He'd been with them for 40 days. You would think by now... They'd seen all of his miracles. They saw all his works. They saw everything he did. They saw him die on the cross and they, some denied him and ran away. And now he's resurrected. They saw him resurrected and he spent 40 days with them. Wouldn't you think by now they got it? Wouldn't you? Uh-huh. Now, here they are and Jesus turns up, <clears throat> verse 17. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Mamma mia, you're kidding me. Now, if I were Jesus and there's 12 of you, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, I'm going down the line. Worshipping, you're in. Worshipping, you're in. Doubting, get out of here. You, you know what I mean? But what does Jesus do? He does not limit it to those that are full of faith and worshipping, even to those who doubt. Then he says, go and make disciples of all nations. I give you authority. See, we think that somehow in our strength we've got to have it all together before God will send us. But that is so out of kilter because Jesus knows something's coming. He knows Pentecost is coming. He knows that when the Spirit comes upon them, all of a sudden they will be delivered from their insecurities because of the power of the Spirit. What are the two significant fears of life? Public speaking and death. To be a witness, what do you have to do? Speak and not fear death. Guess what they were fearful of before Pentecost? They were frightened, hidden away because they were fearful if they spoke and people recognised them, they would die. Then all of a sudden, spirit comes on them at Pentecost, boom, and Peter, the very one who denies, stands up and challenges the crowd. What happened? Pentecost! Let me read you something. I love this. In 348 AD, Cyril of Jerusalem, one of the early church theologians wrote a commentary on this passage and he writes this. They are not drunk in the way you might think. They are indeed drunk, but with a sober intoxication, which kills sin and gives life to the heart which is the opposite to physical drunkness. Drunkenness makes a person forget what he knows. This kind instead brings knowledge of things formerly not known. 
The Holy Spirit is here, my friends, to actually make you aware of all of the gospel, the whole shebang. Some of us have terrible fears and doubts, but that does not disqualify you because what qualifies you is not your strength, but his power. The Holy Spirit wants to visit this church powerfully. He wants to meet you here. And he wants you to meet him there. Both. I want you to close your eyes for a second. If you yourself feel that you're not what you ought to be, should be, could be, You know in your heart. See, no one knows where you are, but he does. And he wants to meet you exactly where you are. Perhaps you are one who's seen many miracles, many works of God, many things. But right now, you're like those 11. You wish you could worship, you wish you could be full of faith, but the reality is that you are filled with insecurities and doubts. The Lord is here. He wants to meet you right where you are at. Right where you are at. There are some of you who have not prayed for a very long time. There's some of you, you haven't even opened the Bible for a while. You know what the Lord says? I'm meeting you here. Let me step into your life. There are some here that your marriages are in strife and you know it. He wants to meet you there. Some of you are battling with your kids and your kids are battling with you. He wants to meet you there. Holy Spirit, would you come? I'm going to ask the musicians just to come. Come, Holy Spirit. Come. Meet your people. Meet your people. Meet your people. Do you know the truth is that no one knows if you're really born again except you? That's the truth. And do you know what will determine whether you're born again? Is complete trust that he has done enough. You can't pray enough. You can't read the Bible enough. You can't go to church enough. It's complete trust. And as you trust him, he'll turn everything around. You'll love what he loves. Would you close your eyes again? If you want to have this complete trust, surrender to Jesus, and you want to meet him, I want to pray for you right now. Or perhaps you've been away from the Lord and you're coming back. Maybe you're once a powerhouse. It's like your battery's gone flat. Would you place your hand in the air? I want to pray for you sincerely that God would move. Thank you, 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 thank you. Father, these people are reaching out to you. They're being honest. I pray you would meet them here. Meet them right where they're at. They're coming to you. They're not asking for flash houses or Ferraris or anything like that. They're asking for an engagement with you. Lord, strengthen them your plan is to send them Lord pour down your Holy Spirit thank you Jesus thank you Jesus would you stand please begin to pray in the spirit Jesus 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 come Holy Spirit come Holy Spirit Rabashire boko sarabate sere borabaka rabashara bate rabashire bate shikere. Meet me here. Meet me here. You know that song? 
Pour down your Holy Spirit, Lord, from the front to the back, left to the right. Father, you are laying your hands on people right now. I want you to imagine he's reaching out to you. He is touching you. He is meeting with you. Come, Jesus. Let's worship our Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. It's all I want. Will you meet me here again? I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? It's all I want. It's all.
I can hear that sound again. I can hear that sound again. Just really extend yourself. Just let's really push in. God doesn't need, he, you don't need someone to lay hands on you tonight. You don't. Because he's meeting you right now. But you need to step forward. There's a sound. I can hear it. It is so, it's humming. The Holy Spirit's here. Lift your hands heavenward. He wants to meet you. He wants to meet you. Begin to pray in the Spirit. Let the Spirit well up in you. Like the, imagine you're there in the upper room.
Thank you, Jesus. Pastor Richard asked, who, who saying, meet me here? Is it, is it you saying it to God or God saying it to me? I, as I thought about that, it's just, it's, for me, it's God. It's saying, it's, it's come and meet me. This year, we've been, we've been praying as a church and gathering even on Tuesdays with some of the staff to pray. And one of my prayers has been, Lord, would you draw us to yourself? You know, the picture that I had was a lot of us, it's God saying, just come. And we're off to the side, distracted on our mobile phones. And I had this picture of some of us are worshipping idols. And we don't call them idols. We don't, it's not a statue. But how many people know we can still be worshipping an idol on the side, lighting a candle to something? Yeah. And God is saying, just, just come. <laughs> come and meet me here. I've got so much to say to you. He's knocking on the door of our heart. He's knocking on the door of the church saying, I just want to meet with you. I just want to eat with you. I just pray that above all else, that with that we would meet with the Lord because he wants to do something amazing in our lives. It goes right back to the Garden of Eden. Adam, where are you? Where are you? Because he wants to meet with us. And Lord, that's the cry of our heart. It's the cry of our heart. We don't want more information more knowledge, more stuff. I just want to meet with you, Lord God. I want to hear the small, still voice of the Holy Spirit. Speak a word deep in our spirits about what you want to do in and through our lives. Hear that small, still voice of the Spirit to say, I love you. I love you. I love you. Hear the small, still voice voice of the Father saying you're my son, you're my daughter and I love you I love you so Lord as we continue together over the last next couple of days it's our prayer in the midst of everything that we do the singing, the word, the interactions as we go home and reflect speak by the Holy Spirit I pray just a word, a thought, a picture that we can take away that will, will, will change the direction we were walking in and will have eternal consequences. It's our prayer and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Could have worshipped for a bit longer, you know. <laughs> Could have lingered just a little bit longer, you know. But we're going to linger tomorrow, okay? <laughs> so we're going to linger back here tomorrow at 9 a.m. And uh, we've got a couple of sessions tomorrow. Pastor Richard will be sharing and then Pastor Michael uh, will be sharing as well in the morning. And uh, we're looking forward to a great day. We're going to gather again tomorrow night and just really uh, enjoy the presence of God. So God bless you. See you tomorrow morning. If you haven't registered, you can still do so. Supper next door. Thank you so much. God bless you.